guess uh, what I'd like you to know is uh, that uh, working for now three years, almost three and a half years, on trying to get Congress to follow something you suggested has, has truly made me humble with reference to uh, what powers and authority and we have, either direct or indirect, and that it takes a long time in a big and powerful, big democratic system to change major things. And patience is a word to, that you don't use very often, but actually I think we're getting a little bit to the point where patience is not good for us because it leads to things taking way too long and it's getting scary. So uh, I, I believe that we've seen abject failure of policy leadership in this town, uh, including the president on what is fundamentally a debt problem that threatens both our economic and our national security. Policymakers have refused to seriously deal with entitlements, especially in the health field, health care field. Our tax code, at best, can be described as complicated and unfair. At worst, the tax code is anti-growth. I just happened to have one of the people that work on this available to look a few things up for me today. And so on this business of the tax expenditures, common people call, ordinary people call those loopholes. They really are not loopholes in the sense they are prescribed. I mean, the law says they're there. They're not somewhere to invent them and fix them. They just use the law. But I uh, thought I'd share with you for one moment this uh, and ask you, uh, uh, what, what one of you volunteer, what's the biggest uh, tax expenditure that is, exists uh, uh, on, on the tax tax code of the United States. That's correct. And, and if the exclusion for employer's health insurance is $164 billion a year. There are literally 100 and plus 100, excuse me. But the big ones uh, start with the health, employer health insurance, and the 10th is employer benefit under the cafeteria plans. Now it's rather incredible that uh, we could so long ago in this quest to get our, our, our budget under control, that we've been talking about the same thing over and over, and the, one of them is that we've got to take these and we've got to abolish them either, either, either quickly or long term, however you'd like it, you've got to get them out of there so that what you, what you change yields more revenue and you can use that revenue for good things. You might wonder, with all of this clamoring to do what is most obvious, why something isn't done. Health care spending uh, is such that if we don't fix it, it will fix us. Uh, it, it will shred the American budget if it isn't fixed. And you as youngsters have an absolute right in asking leaders, including the president, why have you not done something about this when everybody knows it's real? That blue line must be bent. Now, despite all the media coverage and the drama surrounding the fiscal cliff, the agreement that allowed, that was the agreement that allowed us to avoid that cliff did nothing fundamentally to alter our dangerously debt trajectory. We, we left all the problems that fixing the budget would have to all there. Indeed, we are still on track for having a debt to GDP ratio of more than 100% in 10 years. Now, frankly, I want to tell you, we used to always talk about a balanced budget by early days, and much that I've never heard of the ratio of uh, GDP to debt. Because we were looking right around the corner to a balanced budget. Anybody talking about a balanced budget today, literally, unless they reinvent the definition as to what it means, is really pipe balanced, but the budget of the United States won't be balanced for decades if it, if it is. That's because we got in debt so far we can't get out, and we found that we will survive even though there's a big debt. It's just it can't be so big as it is. It's got to get better. And it can't be there without a society that is producing and productive. In other words, the income tax has to be fixed along with it so that it's a growth-oriented matter. Now, three facts that you must know. That is one, that this is debt to GDP ratio 
that we've discussed is unsustainable. If there's anything you get from us, it's that. We, your country, my country, cannot live for a long period of time with the debt of the size we've got is unsustainable. Well, well, if you get solid with that word, as a young, vibrant American, you should. Because it means America could go swimming. We came nowhere close to 100% from our existent day until the Second World War, when we forgot about it all. We said, anything to win. Well, put it up to 200% if you got to, to, to win the war. But boy, it didn't take long after the war, even four years after the war, it was back down below the ratio, which is somewhere around 30% for history. Now, that's the first thing you've got to remember. Second is that Medicare and Medicaid especially cannot survive in their present form. Now that's saying another way that you've got to fix Medicare. This is saying it can't be sustained in the present form. Now, the third thing you've got to remember is that when a crisis hits in the form of soaring interest rates or a continued high job rates, the actions will will have to be taken then will be abrupt, harsh, and cause real economic hardship. That's why we preach, because we would love it to get done. Not harsh, excuse me, not quickly, not abruptly, but in due course, with, with enough solemnity and realization of what we're doing to do it right. These facts we must keep in mind. Chairman Bernanke has said that the debt to GDP ratio is unsustainable, not just us. If we want to address our debt limit until the problem becomes acute, we will be forced to, to serve safety net cuts and, and or broad tax increases almost overnight just to keep us afloat. The 10 year Treasury bills. For some of you, if you're, if you're working in this field of securities and stock and you know, how much interest is being charged, and you say, well, that guy up there is wacky, he's crazy. Interest rates are only 1.9% on average, and then that's cheaper than they've ever been in, in modern days. Something must be right. Well, all we can tell you is that they seem to be thinking that ours is a safer situation than elsewhere. So they're sending their money here. They need everybody, institutions, governments, ship their money to America. And America has to start, has to pay that back. But what happens when that lower interest rate changes to the average that it's been for the last 10 or 15 years? And then they'll have insurers sure shooting. It'll go up to something like 4.7%, which is more realistic. And then uh, the interest payments on our sovereign debt will exceed spending on our national defense. Borrowing up as the rates we have and the size we are at is serious. Fixing it is serious. It's all hard. And uh, I guess I should say, as a citizen of the country, uh, I'm lucky that at my age, I'm called upon by somebody in a small think tank, in this case, named by the Bipartisan Policy Center. That's our small think tank. We work with Alice, Dr. Alice Ribbon of the formidable think tank that she's with and we work together to try to tell our leaders in Washington that whatever's going wrong with the parties, whatever the problem with arguing and the like, those are not really the issue. When will you fix the entitlement programs so they don't break us?